Hello students, this is Mrs. Gielsen. I hope you've found your way to this lecture and you are in your assigned seats and ready to work. We're going to finish our motion notes today and then we're going to move on to some practice in preparation for Wednesday where we will um, make our own motion graphs of our own motion. I mean walking motion. So um, I'm home and you will see some strange shadows because of the overhead lights in my kitchen. Um, and this will be your first introduction to my YouTube channel and video lectures. This is not the usual format. I usually do more of a screen casting in a Neopod situation, but I didn't have the, um, the files for this lecture except for the, or, uh, except for the PDF. So instead, I'm just going to take notes as you would be taking notes and you're going to follow along. So please find this slide in your motion notes. This is a slide we've already looked at and discussed, but I thought this was a good place to begin reviewing since it's been uh, a long weekend since we thought about motion graphs. We discussed motion diagrams. That's the top view here. Um, and this would be one frame per minute of a student walking to school. And we talked about how you get a lot of interesting information, a lot of useful information about motion with a motion diagram, we can see that the student is moving large distances per one minute interval for a while. In fact, for one, two, three minutes. And then the student moves smaller, much smaller distances every minute for the next one, two, three minutes. And then the student, it looks like, moves even farther than before. This distance looks smaller than this distance, though without a ruler it's hard to tell. So the student then moves for a few minutes at an even larger distance. In order to get the quantitative or the number type information from a motion diagram, we need to know how frequently we're drawing or taking snapshots. We need to know how far apart the snapshots are, and or we need a number line or a ruler or something. And it starts to get really messy and complicated if we want the details of the motion from the motion diagram. So next we switched to a motion graph, where on the what usually is called the y-axis, we're, we're graphing position or distance, and then what usually is the x-axis, we're graphing time. So this is the same motion as above, but in a motion graph. And again, we can see that the student is walking, now it looks like a little bit less than 200 meters in three minutes and then less than 100 meters in the next three minutes, and then rather a lot more, so maybe three, 300 meters in the final three minutes. And if we had a more accurate, or rather I should say more precise scale on the X and Y axes, we could tell more about the details. The beauty of a position versus time graph is that we see where the student is by looking at the Y axis and when the student is by looking at the x-axis. But finally, slope, which is rise over run, is the speed. And really, it's not just speed, it's velocity, because we can tell direction. An upward slope is one direction, and a downward slope is the opposite direction. This would be a plus slope, this would be a minus slope. So really not speed, but velocity. Because we know something about direction. Okay, so we ended, you see that went too far away, I believe, if I remember correctly, we ended on this slide discussing what possible um, stories could match the motion of the graph. And we talked about it might be a person walking down a steep mountain. It might be an elevator descending. A rock falling and bouncing some more would look more like this because you'd have a change in direction. So that wasn't one. And then a car driving, stopping, and driving, or a ball hit, caught, and thrown would be moving in the horizontal direction. So for it to be B or E, we would need to switch the Y axis to say something about horizontal motion rather than vertical, rather than up and down. Okay, so here is where we have new information, and we're going to finish the lecture notes today, as I said. I'm not totally sure what, what page this is for you guys, um, and you can see I've zoomed way in on the slides. 
I'm trying to write in the same space that you have for your own lecture notes. So, we're going to talk about uniform motion now. What's uniform about uniform motion is the velocity of the motion. So if you drive your car at a perfectly steady 60 miles per hour, this means you change your position by 60 miles for every time interval of one hour. And now I can see that I really didn't give you enough space to write all of that. If you can't cram it in there, you can always stack on a post-it note, but again, we could also abbreviate it. We could even skip this part because this is just an example. So if you drive your car at a perfectly steady 60 miles per hour, the meaning of 60 miles per hour is that you change your position or you go a distance of 60 miles for every time of one hour. Okay, well, uniform motion is when equal displacements occur during successive time intervals. So I could, I could make that a little shorter by saying equal displacements or equal distances for equal time intervals. Uniform motion, steady speed, and always along a straight line. There is never a change in direction. If uniform motion is occurring. So it's not only a steady speed, equal distances and equal time intervals, but it's also no changes in direction. So a motion diagram of uniform motion looks like these blue dots here, where this is maybe zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is something moving to the right with equal distances in equal time intervals. So what does a motion graph, now we've seen a motion diagram, what does a motion graph of uniform motion look like? Well, we need to have equal distances for equal time intervals, and on a motion graph, that means equal rises over equal runs, so a constant slope. So an object's motion is uniform if and only if its position versus time graph is a straight line. You can see how big my hand is in this <laughs> zoomed in mode. Um, and also being left handed means you can't see what I write until I've written it. This is a new and interesting way to do notes. So again, we're looking at equal rises over equal runs for every section of this graph which leads to a straight line, or which is the definition of a straight line. And the average velocity is the slope. This is something we've already talked about, of the position versus time graph. And we could write that as an equation. We could write average, I'm going to abbreviate it AVG, velocity is equal to the distance <coughs> traveled divided by time interval, and on a position versus time graph, or a distance versus time graph, that's the same thing as the rise divided by the run, which is our definition of slope. And so that's really handy. That's why we're so careful in these motion graphs to graph distance on the what used to be called y-axis and time on what we used to call the x-axis because that way always our slope, rise over run, rise over run, rise over run, is, the, is a visual of the velocity. Okay, so your next slide, actually to the right of this, is about Alan and Beth. I'd actually like to pause in the, the notes here. If you go to your last page, you've got some blank space, and I'd like to insert some new notes because um, we need to talk about average versus instantaneous speed um, as we defined them on the first couple pages. So we now have this idea of slope. So speed or velocity 
is slope of position versus time. Oops, I can see that out of the frame. Um, and we want to kind of talk more about that. Um, so, so what does a position versus time graph look like if speed or velocity is constant? We just talked about that. It looks like a straight line. And so if speed is constant, then the moment-to-moment -moment speed, how fast I'm going at this moment in time and this moment in time and this moment in time is also constant, my moment-to-moment -moment or instantaneous speed is equal to my average speed. If my motion is not constant, however, then we have a problem. What if I'm driving a long distance and my speed is changing as I drive? This is a problem that we encounter in physics on a regular basis. What if the time interval is longer? So what if I'm going from um, my home in Salt Lake City to visit my dad, who is in California, in Benicia, which is a small town by San Francisco. So this is a long drive. It's about 700 miles, in fact. I'm going to let my camera refocus. It's still not quite focused. If I draw a little more, it might focus better. So it's a long drive. It's almost a straight line on I-80, and it goes west. Right, I'm going west if I go from Salt Lake City to California. Let's say it's about 700 miles. And over the whole trip, it takes me about 14 hours to drive. It's a long drive. So what is my average speed? My average speed during this trip is distance divided by time. And that's 700 miles divided by 14 hours. I'll keep my units on. Um, and so 700 divided by 14 is 50 and my units are miles per hour. And that's fine, it's not SI units, but it's our everyday units. So it works for this example. So my average speed as I go is um, 50 miles per hour. My average velocity as I go is speed with direction, so that's 50 miles per hour west. That's great for velocity. And we can kind of use speed and velocity interchangeably now because we know that I'm going west the whole drive. So this is my average speed and velocity. And my problem is, how is average speed or velocity different sometimes from or the same sometimes as um, my instantaneous, my moment-to-moment -moment speed and velocity? Well, in order to talk about that, we need to look at smaller and smaller chunks of my travel, right? Over 14 hours, I go 700 miles. But what about in the first hour? How far do I go as I'm driving through downtown Salt Lake City and out towards the airport? Well, if traffic is bad, it might actually take me one hour to go through downtown Salt Lake City and out towards the airport. So I might only go like 20 miles in one hour. So for my first hour of travel, I'm going a speed of distance divided by time of 20 miles in one hour which is 20 miles per hour over that whole hour. And then I get out onto the salt flats, past the airport, and maybe that next hour, so this is the second hour, maybe I go, you know, 80 miles, maybe even 90 miles, maybe I really push it. So my second hour average speed is distance divided by time is 80 miles divided by one hour. Right, it's the second hour, but it's one hour of interval. So that's 80 miles per hour. I think that's actually the speed limit out on the salt flat. My point is, all of this time, I'm going westbound on my way to California, and over the whole 14 hours, I go the whole 700 miles, but my moment-to-moment -moment speed or velocity is quite different, right? So during downtown kind of traffic, it's very slow. During, um, you know, sort of open road, straight road, um, even if I'm going to speed limit, it's quite fast. But overall, it's neither of those. It's 50 miles per hour west. And if I looked even smaller time intervals, maybe if I looked here at the end of the second hour as I get off of the salt flats, I'm in Wendover, and I might stop for lunch. And so for the third hour, my speed might be zero miles per hour because I'm actually stopped. 
and maybe I go on into Elko, and then I realize I left my wallet back in Wendover, and I have to actually even turn around, and now my speed is backwards, right? Now my velocity is, is actually negative instead of positive, or, you know, eastbound instead of westbound. So the hitch is that average speed and instantaneous speed are not always the same thing. They can differ wildly. The way we find out more information about instantaneous speed is to look at smaller and smaller times. Um, we would not in this class calculate instantaneous speed. We would just talk about it because to calculate instantaneous speed requires um, higher level math. Calculus, in fact. Something to look forward to. So, in any case, we want to make that differentiation. We talked about moment to moment or instantaneous speed. We've talked a lot about average speed. And, of course, I can switch from saying speed to velocity just by adding a direction. Sometimes they're the same, particularly if you're moving at a constant velocity or speed um, in uniform motion. Um, but particularly on longer time interval motion, the instantaneous motion may be quite different from the average motion. Okay, so now we're going to go back to your printed lecture notes. And the slide we were looking at was Alan leaves Los Angeles at 8 a.m. to drive to San Francisco. So this is going to be um, uniform motion. We're going to assume that the motion of these folks is uniform. And we're going to use the information we're given here about the distance from... Los Angeles to San Francisco, the times that Alan and Beth leave, we're going to create a motion graph for each of the people and then use that graph to answer the questions. Who gets to San Francisco first? How long does the first person um, to arrive have to wait for the second person? And of course, I should have put that first, graph motions and discuss. So let's graph this. And when we're graphing motion, again, we want to put distance traveled on the what used to be called y-axis and time on the x-axis. So let me set up my axes and as I'm drawing these axes and making sure I don't run off the screen. So this is distance and it's in miles. Again, we're not in SI units, but that's fine for now. And then our time, we're going to make in hours because we're given this kind of um, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and these people are driving 400 miles, so I'm thinking it's going to take hours. I know it takes hours to drive from L.A. to San Francisco. So L.A. is our starting point, so that will be X equals zero. And then San Francisco is our ending point, and that's X equals 400 miles. Then our start time is sort of zero hours, right, zero hour, and then we're going to do this in hours. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I might need 9, but I'll, I'll run off the page. So there's 1, 2. Okay. And then maybe just for uh, interest and uh, more precision here, if this is 0 to 400, this would be 200 halfway. This would be 300. This would be 100. That just gives me a little better scale. Okay, so again, let's read it and figure out what's going on. Alan leaves Los Angeles at 8 a.m. to drive to San Francisco 400 miles away. So there's our scale. He travels at 50 miles per hour. Beth leaves L.A. at 9 a.m. and drives to San Francisco at 60 miles per hour. Okay, so who gets there first? How long do they have to wait? And all those other questions. So we have the distance, definitely marked out distance of 400 miles. And I'm guesstimating the time to be around eight hours. I think the last time I drove to LA uh, from San Francisco, so the reverse, it took me about nine hours. But um, I might have been driving slow or stopping to see the cows along the way or something. Who knows? Okay, so in any case, what I want to do is I know for sure that Alan goes from zero miles to 400, but I'm not sure how much time it takes him. Instead, I know how fast he goes. So I'm using the, the speed is equal to distance divided by time, and I want to know how much time it takes if I know that he goes 50 miles per hour 
and he drives 400 miles and we're trying to find time. So that's what the algebra looks like. If you've never seen algebra like this, we could write our speed equals distance divided by time equation either as speed equals distance divided by time or distance equals speed times time or time equals distance divided by speed. They're just the three different ways you could rearrange those three variables. Um, and again, if, if you've never seen algebra like this, just somewhere in your notes write down these three options. There's also a triangle way to think about this equation that I can't explain to you quickly here, but we'll talk about it another time. Okay, so the time is going to be 400 miles divided by 50 miles per hour or 8 hours. Okay, so now I know how much time it takes Alan. I know he starts here at 00, zero and we'll say this is 8 a.m., right, because the problem says he leaves, um, he leaves Los Angeles at 8 a.m. to drive to San Francisco 400 miles away. So he goes from 0 to 400 at 0 hours to 8 hours. So his ending point is about here. And I don't have a ruler or I can't find a ruler in my house. So we want to draw a straight line. We'll assume that he travels in uniform motion. And so this blue line is Allen. Then I want to look at what we know about his friend Beth. So Beth leaves LA at 9 a.m. Okay, so Beth doesn't leave at the same time. She's not leaving here zero hour at 8 a.m. Instead, she leaves one hour earlier. This is 9 a.m. This would be 10, 11, 12, 1, p.m., 2, p.m., 3, p.m., 4 p.m., right? But so Beth starts here rather than Alan starting here. She does the same drive, so the same 400 miles. She's still driving from L.A. to San Francisco, but instead she drives at 60 miles per hour. So I want to find her time so I can lay it out on the graph. So Beth's time will be the same 400-mile distance but divided by 60 miles per hour instead of 50 miles per hour. She's going faster, so it takes her less time. And this is not going to be um, a whole number. It is 6.6667. Right, so six and two thirds, I think. Two thirds being six, seven, yeah. We could write it as six and two thirds of an hour either way, right? Okay, so we know that Beth now needs six and two-thirds hour from the time she left, so from nine. So there's one hour for Beth, two, three, four, five, six hours for Beth, and two-thirds, right? I'm sort of marking this into thirds. So there's about where Beth ends. She still drives from L.A. to San Francisco during that same, during that time interval. Let's see. There's, Alan is supposed to have arrived at eight. Eight hours later, she's supposed to have arrived one hour plus six and two-thirds hour. So she arrives a little bit before him, and we can confirm, ooh, that's supposed to be a straight line, that she did so because she was traveling at a, at a faster speed. So Alan's slope is not as steep as Beth's slope, but they both have the same rise. They both reach the same position, but Beth does so a little bit before Alan. Alan arrives at eight hours later. Beth arrives at six and two thirds, but she started an hour later than Alan. So a total of seven and two thirds. So Beth arrives one third of an hour before Alan. So let's see if we've answered all the question now. The question is, who gets there first, and how long does the first wait for the second? So we can tell that Beth arrives first, her, her, her slope is steeper, and she reaches her rise point sooner than Alan, and she was there two-thirds of an hour, or rather, she was there one-third of an hour before Alan, knowing that she took six and two-thirds hour, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and two-thirds, while he took eight hours total, but started an hour earlier. And that is a fine final answer to this question. Now we'll go back to our lecture notes and finish them up. So we have a slide about vectors versus scalars. And we've already talked about vectors and scalars, but let's review 
we did the um, definitions earlier. So, um, the distance an object travels is a scalar quantity. Oh, I'm on my pink. Uh, hmm. I can't write quantity in this space I've given you. Scalar quantity, which is independent of direction. Distance doesn't have anything to do with direction. Displacement, however, is the vector that points from start to finish of your travel, and so that's a vector quantity. I'm just going to write vector rather than vector quantity because I can't fit the words in there, and you can do the same. So distance is a scalar, independent of direction. Displacement is a vector equal to the final position minus the initial position, or we could just say the line from start to finish. An object's speed is a scalar. We've talked about how you don't care about direction and speed. We're just saying how fast. Um, speed is how fast an object is going, and it's always positive. We don't worry about direction, so we leave speed as a positive number. Another way to say that is it's the absolute value. That may be a math term you're not familiar with, though. Velocity is a vector, or you could say vector quantity, because it's how fast you're going and where you're going. So it includes direction. And then in one dimension, the direction of velocity that the direction of velocity is specified by the positive or negative sign. We talked about the slope. You could also say slope, right? We talked about how a positive velocity is an upward facing slope and a negative velocity is a downward facing slope and that indicates going one direction versus the other. So maybe you're going forward, now you're going backward. So let's look at this one again because I think there was a fair bit of writing there. The distance an object travels is a scalar independent of direction. Displacement is a vector because we need to know the direction. Speed is a scalar. We don't care about direction. Speed is how fast an object is going and it's always positive. It's a positive number. Velocity is a vector because it includes direction. And if we're talking about one dimension, that means forward, backward, or side to side, or up down, we can say direction in terms of positive or negative. Positive or negative sign will tell us about direction in one dimension. All right, our last two, I think. These are our last two. No, we have three questions left on three slides. So here's a position graph for an object moving around. Um, and we can see that the object goes from 0 to 20 meters as time goes from 0 to 4 seconds. I'm asking you at 1.5 seconds, what's the velocity? So velocity is going to include direction by saying, are you going this way or this way? This will be a positive velocity. This will be a negative velocity. So think about it for a minute. What does velocity mean if we have a position versus time graph or a motion graph? So now that you've thought about what position, or rather what speed or velocity looks like on a motion graph, let's figure it out. At 1.5 seconds, so I'm saying at this moment in time, what is the velocity of the object? So velocity is slope. It's quite steep here. And the way I find velocity is to find the rise divided by the run. So in this section of the graph, from one second to two seconds, which includes 1.5 seconds, I have a steady rise of 20 meters and a run of not two seconds, but this is one second. So my rise over run is 20 divided by one or 20 meters per second. And it's in the positive direction compared to the negative direction. So the correct answer is B. Now we do it again for a different point on the graph. Second to last slide of the lecture. Here's a position versus time graph, a motion graph of an object. It's the same graph as before. So we see this object going from 0 to 20 meters over 0 to 4 seconds. 
And now I'm asking you at three seconds, what's the object's velocity? So we're not here anymore, now we're over here. So I'm looking at this moment, but I can see that at this moment, I'm part of this straight line. What's the velocity of the object during that time? I hope you noticed that we have a drop here, not a rise, but a drop from 20 all the way down to zero. I go from 20 down to zero here. So I have a rise over run of drop of 20 during a time of two seconds. So I have a slope of negative 10. D is the correct answer. Then finally, here are two lines. This is kind of like Alan and Beth, actually. A little bit different because they're leaving at different positions um, rather than leaving at different times. But the question is, do A and B ever have the same speed? And if so, when? To answer this question, we have to remember what is speed. What is speed, or we could say velocity, when we're looking at a motion graph? Well, I hope you decided that speed is the slope, the steepness of the graph. A is a straight line with a relatively steep slope. B is a straight line with a not so steep slope. And those slopes of A and B are, are constant and not the same. So they never have the same speed because they never have the same slope. They do have something in common right here. What is it that they have in common at this point in the graph? It's not speed because they don't have the same slope. At this time, right, we're looking at time, they have the same position. So if they have an intersection, it's position that's the same. They have to have the same slope, so they'd have to be parallel lines to have the same speed. And so we're 30 minutes in, and this is the end of the lecture. You should now have complete lecture notes, so all of the blanks are filled in for all of the pages of motion notes. If you're missing pages or you're missing um, blanks, you can certainly talk to a friend or neighbor if the substitute teacher allows that if you're behaving appropriately. If you're not able to talk to a neighbor for whatever reason, you'll find the rest of the lecture notes, so the, the stuff that we did in previous class periods, on Canvas as a PDF file. Now you're going to go to the to-do list for today, and you're going to see that the next thing I want you to do is the assignment for today. So in the purple book, you're going to um, you're going to do some reading of sections 1 and 2 of chapter 3. You're going to take notes on sections 1 and 2 of chapter 3. You need to take distinctively different notes for each section, so you have some way to title it. You decide the format of the notes. They could be Cornell notes, or they could be, I don't know, you could make um, um, cartoon notes if you want. You can draw, you can write. It's up to you, but you need to have two distinct sections, 1 and 2, section 1 and section 2 of your notes. And then you're going to answer the questions that I've listed. Whatever you don't finish is your homework. You must finish this before class on Wednesday because it's due on Wednesday. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday when we will start um, what I think is a super fun lab about motion. So I'll see you all on Wednesday.